very warm welcome to the third in our series of Genome Lates, which is brought to you by Welcome Genome Campus Connecting Science. And my name is Ken Skeldon, I'm head of the public engagement team, which is part of Connecting Science. And it's great to have so many of you join us this evening. There's um, over 200 people here already and uh, more joining as I speak. So during uh, this series of Genome Lates, we've been discussing and exploring big themes in genomics and biodata. And inspired by this year being the 20th anniversary of the first draft of the human genome being published. And it's also 30 years since the start of the International Human Genome Project effort, which the Wellcome Genome Campus played such a leading role in. All our speakers have connections to the campus, which hosts the Wellcome Sanger Institute, Connecting Science, and the European Bioinformatics Institute. So we very much set this um, series up around conversations because we want to explore the science, but we also want to hear um, your reflections around some of the issues that our speakers are going to be talking about around genomics and biodata. Um, so we want to hear from, from you, the audience. We'll be leaving good time for questions and discussion. If you do have a question or comment, then uh, please, if you can use the Q&A feature on the Zoom page, which you'll either see at the top or bottom of the screen, depending on uh, the device that you're using to connect with uh, this evening. Don't worry, uh, we always say this, but don't worry if it looks like you're the only one asking a question because um, your questions come in in a feed to us and then uh, we'll be trying behind the scenes to make sure that we answer as many of them as we can. So uh, without further delay, um, uh, it's just, it leads me to introduce tonight's um, speakers and chair. And so first of all, um, tonight's guest speaker from the campus is Professor Ewan Burney who's direct, Deputy Director General of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, or EMBL for short, uh, which has its headquarters in Heidelberg. And he's also the Joint Director of the European Bioinformatics Institute, which is EMBL EBI for short. Uh, and that's part of the EMBL, and that's located at the Wellcome Genome Camp Campus in uh, Cambridgeshire. Um, Ewan completed his PhD at the Wellcome Sanger Institute before becoming Head of Nucleotide Data at EMBL EBI in 2000. He led the analysis of the Human Genome Project gene set, including the ENCODE project, which looked at the non-coding parts of DNA making up the human genome. Ewan's main research interests include functional genomics, DNA algorithms, and statistical methods to analyze genomic information. Ewan's also a non-executive director of Genomics England and a consultant and advisor to a number of companies, including Dovetail Genomics, uh, Glasgow Smith Klein and uh, Oxford Nanopore Technologies. He's received a number of awards and honours, uh, including the Francis Crick Award from the Royal Society. He was also made a Fellow of the Royal Society in 2014, and he received a CBE in 2019. Ewan's a passionate advocate for data science and biology, regularly creating lively threads and posting comments on topical issues on social media. And tonight's guest chair gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Hannah Fry, who's an associate professor in the mathematics of cities at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis at University College London, where she studies patterns in human behavior. Her research applies to a wide range of social problems and questions from shopping and transport through to urban crime, riots and terrorism. Uh, alongside a research career, Hannah is, of course, an experienced broadcaster and passionate public advocate for maths and science. Um, her critically acclaimed BBC documentaries include uh, Horizon, Diagnosis on Demand, The Computer Will See You Now, Britain's Greatest Invention, uh, City in the Sky, which was about the aviation industry, Magic Numbers, Hannah Fry's Mysterious World of Maths, The Joy of Winning, Contagion, The BBC Four Pandemic, and calculating ADA about the life and work of Ada Lovelace. In 2019, Hannah also presented the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures called Secrets and Lies, which explored the hidden power of maths. On radio, she presents or co-presents the Curious Cases of Rutherford and Fry on BBC Radio 4, and The Maths of Life with Lauren Laverne on, on Radio 6. And Hannah's also the author of Hello World, How to Be Human in the Age of the Machine, was published in 2018. Hannah's awards and honours include the UCL Provost Award for Public Engager of the Year and the Christopher Zeman Award for Public Understanding of Maths from the Institute of Mathematics 
and its applications, and the London Mathematical Society. So we are in for a treat. It's going to be a great event. And without further delay, uh, I'm delighted now to hand over to Hannah and Ewan to hear more about big data in biology, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joining us. It's lovely to see um, some really amazing numbers there, uh, including, I understand, joining us, we have uh, Jock Burney, which is you and dad, and possibly your mum too. <laughs> hello, mum. <laughs> Joy and Jock, hello. <laughs> it's, uh, it's good to have you both with us. Um, okay, you and I think uh, we should probably start at the beginning with all of this, 20th, 20th year anniversary. Um, but I wanted to know about the idea behind the human genome project in the beginning what was the what was the motivation behind uh, behind this project behind sequencing the entire human genome well i think that goes back a long way into the into the 80s um and sort of the end of the 70s um fred sanger and other scientists worked out how to sequence dna so how to read the chemical which is dna it was long known um that dna uh was the store of the, the information that makes life, the sort of hereditary information that starts this. So, so people knew that reading it was going to be kind of foundational. And it, although it was absolutely huge, um, the human genome, they, people realized that it was going to be physically possible to do that. And so in the 1980s, a number of scientists came together and said, we can determine the sequence of the human genome. Uh, we're going to need to develop technology when they're going to need to do a number of different things but that will be a foundation which a lot of science will depend on in the future but what okay so why did they decide to do the entire thing all at once like why couldn't you just do little bits of it yeah you people suggested that and uh people suggested um let me switch off the things that are going to go <laughs> Um, oh no, that's not going to work. You're getting WhatsApp messages from your mum. <laughs> Adam. <laughs> um, uh, um, so, um, uh, people, some people suggested that, and indeed some people did that. And uh, what, there's a variety of ways of sequencing the important bits of the human genome. So the human genome makes protein coding genes and other, other things that, that uh, go off and make proteins. And, um, and so there was ways of sequencing just those bits. But one of the drivers to the genome is that it's sort of a, a complete thing. It's a bounded unit of information. Um, and so there was a huge desire to get the whole lot, uh, even the boring bits, as it were, uh, uh, of, of the human genome. And so most people said, if we're gonna do this, let's do this, uh, do the whole human genome. And do you think that that is something that has served science well, as it were, having the entire thing? Is there, is there extra, uh, uh, have we learned more about uh, ourselves, I guess, from having the entire thing, including the boring bits? Yes, and the boring bits, I mean, everybody, scientists can get interested in all sorts of different things. So even the boring bits, if you're interested in them, get pretty interesting. There's lots of things to discover. Um, there's also an interesting question about what's boring and what's not boring. Mm. So that's another uh, another point. Um, and there's two aspects of it. So, so it's it's also become a very as well as just sort of having it. Um, the important thing is that you can use it to design experiments, map experiments, understand evolution. So it's an incredibly useful, incredibly useful thing, as well as a sort of foundational information resource. So this was a gigantic, gigantic project that was years in the making. I mean, is it fair to say that this is the first time that biology had really been done at that sort of scale before? I think that's a fair comment. And in particular uh, for the human genome. So the smaller genomes, one could kind of do it more like a very large lab. Um, uh, but the human genome definitely had a factory style element to it in the 90s and a completely new way of justifying that amount of money coming into this area of science and organizing the people into the into uh groupings that would deliver on it it was much closer to a big physics project than it was a small laboratory uh, project what do you mean by factory style do you mean as in you you do this bit you do this bit you do that bit 
so yes, there's definitely, there was both that kind of factory style in the sense of a division of labor um, with robots doing some bits and then people doing handoffs to other people. But then also inside that there were, in particular the Sanger Center where I um, started with uh, as a student, there were teams and the teams would do, they were quite competitive. Um, there was internal competition about who was doing more or less than the other teams. So it was a great esprit de corps to do this one thing, which was to sequence the human genome. Uh, wait, okay, so that competition that you're talking about I, I, and, and the divvying up, as it were, are we literally talking about you take this section of the genome and sequence it and you take this section? Abs well, certainly in the 90s, that was the way. And so people had to, before you could do that divvying up bit, they had to map it. So there was a oh, yeah. step before that, which was sort of creating a big map of which bits of genome were where, and by which bits of genome, there would be chunks of DNA that was in the freezer. You didn't know the sequence of that chunk of DNA, but you knew it went to this kind of vague location there. And then once it was mapped, uh, people would say, well, I will do this chunk. Um, and um, different labs across the world, quite big labs, would, would sort of stick little metaphorical flags onto different parts of the genome and say, this bit is going to be done by the Sanger Institute. This bit's going to be done, for example, by Genoscope in Paris. This bit's going to be done uh, by the Whitehead Genome Institute in Boston. So as the project progressed, did everyone keep up their end of the bargain? Did everyone who'd planted a flag in a section of the genome submit it on time? So, well, what happened was, was somebody else came along. Um, uh, so so the, there was a plan, it was sort of, sort of formulated in the 90s, 90, early 90s, and, and it sort of stretched out into 2010. And uh, some people were making steady progress and some people had planted some, some flags, but were building up technologies and, and talking about different ways of sequencing their bit. Uh, but bagsing it before they got there. Well, the bagsing it, they were doing <laughs> technology development. Uh, <laughs> whilst uh, I'll get into trouble by saying bagsing it. Um, I just like the idea of it being like sun lounges when you're, uh, <laughs> when you're on holiday. And you're like, I'm having that bit. <laughs> I'm having that bit. Well, there were the Japanese, um, uh, uh, the the Sanger um, Institute, the British, got one of the small chromosomes. So it's quite nice getting a small chromosome because you could finish it quickly and get the whole thing. Mm. Um, so one of the small chromosomes um, went to Sanger, but the the other small chromosome went uh, was was done by the Japanese. So they they happened first, as it were, those two. And won the race. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first human chromosomes, yes. Yeah. Um, I just, I'm just interested in what you said there about how you had to map it before you could, I'm using my word again, <laughs> before you can bag see bits of it. And I'm very intrigued about just how much you knew about the human genome before, before it was sequenced, before you got to the end, how much you knew about it. I mean, were you even aware at, at, collectively of how much work would be involved, of how many, how many genes there were even? Yeah, well, so um, the amount of work you could start to work out um, as you as you started going through this, how much work it would take to get to the um, to get to the kind of end of this, and it was quite a lot. I mean, it was pretty eye watering um, for things like the human genes. Now, this is a, this is a great story um, because uh, back in the the sort of mid seventies. Some people sort of did a back of the envelope calculation when they saw the first protein coding RNA. And they, um, they had pretty good estimates of the size of the human genome. And they had some estimates of the size of, uh, of the extent of some genes on the, on the human genome. They literally divided one by the other. And they sort of said, well, the genes probably all packed together. Um, and it came out with a nice round number of 100,000. So, 100,000 <laughs> genes went, protein coding genes went into uh, textbooks. And certainly when I was an, an undergraduate, if you, you know, that was the right answer. When you wrote an essay about the number of genes, um, you would write 100,000, around 100,000 for the human genome. But we didn't really know. And um, certainly as we started to sequence uh, the human genome, um, there was a little bit of a problem. The first, one of the, these two small chromosomes, one of them was quite gene dense 
and um, and you know that was suggesting a, a reasonably large number, but not not a hundred thousand, more like fifty thousand, forty thousand, this sort of thing. But the the other one, and the, in fact, sequenced by the Japanese, was really not that gene dense at all, and there were there were big bits that didn't obviously have a gene. Um, and so that was a, that was definitely head scratching. Um, was that because the chromosome a little bit weird? Could we not find the genes? What was going on? But uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to go on to tell me your story because you do have a good story about this, don't you? There story is a good story. Go on, you tell tell, me, tell us the story. <laughs> okay, so um, but before we do that story, we have to talk about Craig Venter. So Craig Venter is and and why everything sped up. So Craig Venter. Well, let me let me go back and talk first about about John Salston. So John Salston um, is this um, amazing uh, scientist. He's he's one of the people who's looked into how the C. elegans worm works, done all sorts of the different things. And as he did that, he realised that he really wanted the genome of the worm, and so he built a bunch of technology and he worked out how to get the genome of the worm. And as he did that, he said to himself, "Well, if we're going to do that. Let's do the human." And he was what year was this? When was this? This was sort of late 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and he was one of the scientists who said, this is possible, we can sequence the human genome, we will be able to do it. And he was also visionary in the sense that he both went to the Wellcome Trust and said, if you give me a fair whack of money, I will be able to do a lot of this. Um, but he said, it's only fair if I get this, that I give this data straight away to all of scientists. I can't kind of hog the data, I can't hold the data for my own lab. I'm not doing mm. it for my own lab. I'm doing it, I'm doing it for everyone. And a number of other scientists thought the same way. I'm um, in particular Bob Waterston in um, in the US. Um, and John and Bob basically did the worm genome as a double act, in effect. Uh, both with with these big teams in this kind of team like way and people would go between St. Louis and, and um, Cambridge and swap and swap techniques. Um, but a American scientist entrepreneur called Craig Venter uh, had met a computer scientist called Gene Myers, um, really Gene, incredibly intelligent and lovely guy. Um, and he um, uh, uh, said that you could sequence genomes just by randomly sequencing bits of DNA. You did not have to know which bit goes where in the genome. You don't have uh, to do the mapping before you start. You don't have to do the mapping before you start because DNA sequence has a particular, every piece of sequence is reasonably unique. Um, there's a, there's a, and, and we can get into the word reasonable. Um, just by sequencing the DNA, you can work out how to put the jigsaw puzzle together later on. Now, people had known that, but they, they had thought that you could only do that in quite small bits of, of, of DNA. And, and uh, Gene, as a computer scientist, kind of did the good computer science maths and said, no, this should, this should work out pretty much no matter how big the genome is, as long as these other conditions hold. And um, so Craig Venter, a kind of entrepreneur scientist, talked to, talked to Gene, showed that this could work in bacteria, and then in the mid 90s, he um, persuaded the US stock market to give him a lot of money um, and uh, to sequence the genome by 2000, the human genome. And then he would sell private access to the human genome for at least the 10 years between 2000 and 2010. Before the public project. Yeah, before the public finished. project completed. Now, I was just starting up as a student um, at the Sanger Institute at this time, and I remember when this announcement came out, and it was absolutely, you know, it was kind of electric. Um, and one of the electric questions was, well, what is the public project going to do? Is it going to just sort of pack up its bags and walk away because this person has sort of declared they're going to do it? Are they going to just keep on going and ignore him? And in fact, what they did was a third thing, and the third thing was to sort of double down on, on doing it fast in the public domain. And to do that, they kept the same idea that you're gonna do one little chunk at a time, but no more bagsying. Everybody could just go in and do a chunk um, and then we were all gonna sort it out afterwards. And so suddenly the project went very, very fast um, up to 2000. 
When you say the, the reaction was electric, were people, what was people's reaction? Were people angry at the idea that, that someone was going to kind of sweep in with, with private money and, and try and sell access to the human genome? Or, or were people, uh, I guess, um, enthused and motivated by the competition? I mean, I think for most of us, it was the latter. I mean, I think some people felt the former, perhaps. But for most of us, it was a real demonstration that, that what we were doing was really important, that this person was also going to do it and, and stuff like that. So I felt, I, I remember discussing the ins and outs of whether the strategy would work and, you know, uh, and other things. But most, above all, there was a sense that, and I think also because of, the other sense was that we knew that John Salston was going to not stand for a private company having it. I mean, he, he didn't want a single academic to have it and then give it out to everybody. He wanted, he really wanted it for everybody. And indeed, what later transpired in his books, kind of good on this, is that he went to the Wellcome Trust and he said, look, it may well be that the academics in America can't do it. In fact, the, the, you know, with private money coming in, there's an argument that there, sh there shouldn't be a, a public money spent on this. And so he, said, he asked the Wellcome Trust whether they would back him for the whole thing. And the Wellcome Trust said, yes, we will back you to do the whole thing. And so then he went into discussions about accelerating the public project, knowing that if necessary, he could just say, the Sanger Center at the time, not Institute, the Sanger Center will sequence the entire human genome uh, with confidence. And I guess the rest is history in many ways. Indeed, though, though an important part of the history, I do feel for Gene, so Gene was kind of right. Gene, Gene, Gene Myers, the computer scientist who worked out you could do it randomly. He was, he was basically right. I mean, there are some edges and there are some complications where it's harder, where, where his conception um, would have had a difficult uh, aspect. And one slightly frustrating thing for Gene was that the private company switched from sequencing the human genome to the mouse genome because the public project made a commitment to releasing all of its data publicly, including to be used by the private project. And so the people with the money in the private project said, well, this is, you know, what are we doing here? Why, why are we spending so much money doing something that is going to come for us for free? Um, and that is one of the reasons why, why my career got at such a big boost, because at that point they said, well, the public project is going to sequence all this um, uh, data, uh, this genome, but they won't really understand it. They won't be able to find the genes and use it and everything else. And we've got these incredibly clever computer scientists and you know, Gene Myers and, mm. and some other extremely clever people. And, uh, and everybody's going to come for, for the Solera human genome because the public human genome won't be interpretable. It's not that the data won't be there. You just won't be able to use the public one. Now, I was a kind of student. I was, I was pretty young, 25 or something. Um, but I was one of the people doing building computer programmers programs to, to understand the human genome um, and other genomes at scale with my colleague in particular, my colleague Michelle Clamp, who was kind of my partner in crime um, in doing this. And uh, suddenly our, our piece of uh, <laughs> stopped being sleepy and people came to us and said, right, you know, that bit where you say you can do it in a computer, do you really mean it? Can you really make it work? Um, and so we had a very, very hectic, I mean, really fun, but really stressful year of getting um, this, this big kind of interpretation engine to scale um, um, over, over, you know, 18 months or so. But your code essentially ended up right at the heart of the project. So for gene prediction, I mean, there's many different hearts of the project here. Uh, um, like an octopus. So, 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 so there are, you know, I wouldn't, the heart, you know, you know, a major artery of the project. Mm, okay. Um, funnily enough, that piece of code still runs today. I'm, okay. I'm both proud. I'm proud of it. It's a, it's a very good hidden Markov model. What did um, you write it in? I... <laughs> Fortran. <laughs> no, no. You'll laugh. Um, I wrote my own very, very cranky computer language. Uh, so I, I wrote a little computer. I mean, it's, it's a bit like C++, mm -hmm. but it has hidden Markov models as a kind of programming primitive. 
Um, and um, so the so I could write these I could write extraordinarily complex hidden Markov models, and then it would compile down to code um, uh, and run relatively fast. Um, though it still doesn't run that fast. Um, uh, but, but literally nobody else on the planet could, could write these kind of very complex hidden Markov models. I mean, mainly just because of debugging them would be mm. just a nightmare. Um, uh, so Maybe. I, I wrote a programming language, yeah. Maybe it's worth us actually just pausing for a moment to um, just briefly explain. I know um, we have some students who are joining us this evening. Uh, just to, to briefly explain what, what we actually mean by DNA sequencing. What does it mean to sequence the human genome? Yeah, so it's a very common question and, and we're, we, we use it so vernacularly, it, it, it's important to go back. So, so DNA in some sense, it's, it's a polymer. It's a very simple chemical. Um, it has, and it's a polymer made from four different units. And each one of those units, we could write down the chemical structure for each one of those units. And, you know, it's, I don't know how many carbons and how many nitrogens and how many, you know, but we don't, we give them names, adenosine, cytosine, guanosine, and thymine. And actually it's too long to write those names down as well. So we actually just use A, C, T, and G. So we, we, we summarize the polymer as a string of letters. Um, and if you go and look at DNA sequence, it is just a massive string of letters, which is A, C, T, and G. And so when we say sequence the human genome, we mean determine the polymer of, the, determine the sequence of, of this, this polymer. You only have one of four, four possible units. Um, but it's worth saying each, in each cell, we have two copies of a three billion letter polymer, uh, which if you, and, and you know, this experiment you can do in mice, you, you don't do it in humans. If you take the mouse's fibroblast and you take just those six billion letters and you clean it up and you inject it into another cell, it will, and you put that cell just right into a pregnant mouse and everything else, it will make an entire mouse. So that information is sufficient in a cellular context to make an entire uh, organism. So there is something deeply powerful about mm. this very, very simple polymer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the most powerful of all in many ways, the, the most, yeah, intricate um, data sets there are. Um, uh, I want to talk about, though, just back to that idea of how much everyone knew about what was there in this incredibly detailed series of sentences that describe a human. Um, how much people knew about that before uh, the project was done. Uh, because didn't you start a little bet, a little sweepstake at a conference? Yes. Tell us that story. So that was, uh, so, you know, the, the public project was racing and the private project was racing and we were all trying to say, and oh, there was another company at this time uh, that had done it, uh, sequencing only the interesting bits. Um, and they had, they had declared that they had finished um, uh, sequencing the interesting bits and they were selling a database of 100,000 genes, which neatly corresponded to the textbook definition. Mm -hmm. Of handy. handy. Yeah, handy. Um, so we were all racing and putting these things together. Michelle and I were staying up late and having gin and tonics whilst we watched our computers kind of either fall down or, or not fall down uh, with these big computer jobs. And um, uh, most of us were who doing the analysis was like, this is not making sense. We are not finding as many protein coding human genes as we expected. And I remember being berated, literally, by John Solston. He's like, I'm sure there's more. Go, go find more genes. Uh, and you were like, um, where are they? We can't where find are them. They? Yeah, like <laughs> um, and in May of 2000, um, we all came together, and the genome community every year, from its, really from its foundation, from the, from the start, from the time when it was first decided that this was a good idea, that decision would happen in Cold Spring Harbor, New York on Long Island, beautiful location. And, they, and we come together pretty much every May there and we, we give fast paced talks to each other. So I stood up and I gave the talk about uh, Michelle and my work and Tim Hubbard as well, I should mention here. Um, 
and uh, on on the genes and kind of how we were thinking about finding them using computers. And I ended up brandishing a book um, saying, and I will take a bet. Uh, uh, tonight I will go around and I will take a bet for as, as a sweepstake, the, the closest number to the final number of genes will get this, the, the pot. Um, and so please place your bets. Um, and remember, I'm, I don't know what, I'm 25 or something, I'm quite young. <laughs> I don't know half the people or three quarters of the people in the room. Um, they're Nobel laureates knocking around. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I brandish my, my book around with a little cup and I decide that in that year, each number, you would have to buy it for $1. The next year, it'd be $5. And the third year, it'd be $20. And then the year after that, we would decide on the number of human genes. Now, one interesting thing about that, with a bet like this, you have to have a definition. You have a definition for the mm. bet, yeah? And so that's probably the most interesting thing. Well, there's two interesting things. One is the definition of a protein coding gene by, for the purposes of the bet. For the, for the scientists on the audience, would you believe we got into arguing about trans splicing? And so there is a trans splicing clause in the in the in the bet. Um, so it, it's quite detailed uh, uh, there. But the other incredibly surprising thing is is best described by this kind of shocking talk at the time by um, Hugues Roast Crodius, who was a French comp bioinformatician, a computational scientist like myself. And he worked with Jean Weissenbach, who ran the French Genome Project. And they had sequenced a small fish, um, uh, Fugu, tetra, tetraodon, actually. It's a different, slightly different, uh, but a bit like Fugu. And they'd come up with an estimate of the number of human genes, which was around 26,000 protein coding genes. Now, everybody thought that they were pretty bonkers, basically. They were mad. What, too low? They were saying too low. Too low. So, so low, so low. So, mm. you know, Insight was selling this database of 100,000 genes. Maybe if you kind of averaged, uh, you looked at chromosome 22, which they've done a pretty good job on, you might say there's about 30 or 40,000 genes, 50,000 genes. So maybe 100,000 was a bit overblown. But, you know, there's no way we're going to come up with sort of something in the sub 30s at the time. So Oog um, wrote his bet at, at his estimate, very solidly, 26,000, something other than something other. And then two other people quite wisely, Paul Denny and Lee Rowan, quite wisely um, bid under the lowest number. Smart. Smart. <laughs> um, uh, and so the lowest number ended up being in the bet somewhere around 25,000 or 24,000. So it's pretty we, close. It's pretty close. Yeah. So we wind out to uh, four years later when we say that we're going to declare the winner. And we still are slightly, there's, you know, it's like rounding up cats or something, genes in the human genome. So there's, there's still a whole bunch of things where you're sort of wondering precisely, you know, should this like be two genes or one gene? What are we doing here? There's a whole drama about, about this. It is really, really complicated. But we were very confident at that point that there were less than 21,000 genes. So basically, and so I, I, the bets, we, we had, I don't know, 500 scientists put in bets. How many Nobel, Nobel laureates? Yeah, uh, four or five, six <laughs> Nobel laureates, yeah. And, and they were all wrong. All of us were wrong. I put in 42,251, I think, or something like that. We, we all were wrong. Um, and indeed, Lee um, won, Lee Rowan won. Though I did, I talked to her and I said, look, Lee, I really think Oog, <laughs> Oog Rose Grillius anchored this whole thing. And so <laughs> fact, she agreed that the, the, the bottom three numbers should be split. Yeah, um, she didn't so much as uh, guess it correctly, it's just game the system there. That's yeah, like... though I think Lee, I, I don't know, Lee always said that she, she thought there weren't that many genes in the human genome. I, I, I don't know if that was hindsight or not. The person, <laughs> the person who, who absolutely, though, stuck by his guns was, uh, was Oog, for sure. Yeah, yeah. What a great story. I really like that.
Okay, when, when the human genome actually was completed, what are we talking about here? How was it published? So, in a, in a, in a, the first question is how many times was it published? Because it was published about three times. And we'll have a, a fourth, I think, coming up um, because we have rather amazingly managed to get through the really, really tough bits recently. Just recently, we've got through the incredibly tough bits. Um, so it was announced um, um, uh, that the public project and the private project had kind of reached the finish line at the same time. This was a deal brokered by Bill Clinton. Um, and, uh, and it had Tony Blair beamed in by teleconference. And we all had a party at the Sanger Center and John Salston um, kind of brought in champagne and stuff like that. So there was a, it was a, it first happened by press conference, which is not really the right way to do it, but I mean, I did understand it was, it was a hot topic. And then there was a publication in science and a publication in nature. That was a lot of effort and um, a lot of work. I, I, I had some sleepless nights in my little section of it, along with other colleagues around the world to try and make that work. But that was the draft. That was kind of a low resolution picture of the genome. It had a lot of holes. We knew there were mistakes. It was a pretty messy thing. It did work, um, but it was not a pretty, it was not a pretty representation. And so three years, four years later, a much better version was published. And then I think another version was published another five years later. So it's very important to realize that we have versions of the human genome very similar, I often say, to the, to the idea that there's versions of the complete works of Shakespeare. And suddenly you might discover that there's a, a sonnet that no previous edition had, and you've got to work out where you're going to put it, and, and you've, got to, you've got to put it in right. Um, and so in a similar way, uh, we keep on improving our understanding of the human genome. Are we talking about an actual physical book here? I mean, uh, in early on, was it an actual physical book? So, so it wasn't, early on it wasn't a book. There's, there's one thing, um, people at the Welcome Collection did a very clever thing and they printed out the whole genome as a big book. And so you can go to a bookshelf and you can pick it out and you can leave through. The recipe for a human. The recipe for human life. <laughs> it does look very, very dull. Um, <laughs> when you open it, is it just TC? It a is ACTG, ATG, TC, whatever. Not a page turner. Uh, no, no. Though when I started, when I started in Cold Spring Harbor, um, so when I was a, I was a real kid then, um, the lab I went to, um, you know, in the 1980s, EMBL, the, the institution I'm now deputy director general of, um, collated all the, the known DNA sequence, um, so, sort of, I mean, not quite by hand, but you know, people typed it in on typewriters and, and stuff like that, very early computers. So this was before the internet. And indeed, you could order, so these were viruses and little bits of plants and little bits of human, the odd bit of cats or something like that, all sort of weird and wonderful bits of DNA. And you could order the world's DNA in book form and it would arrive like the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, and, and so you sort of slot it into your bookshelf. And uh, I remember, you know, looking at this rather amazing bookshelf and sort of picking it down and leafing through and stuff like that. It was, it was very, very low tech um, uh, stuff. Um, and it was very exciting when they distributed it in CD-ROM, CD-ROM format. It was a big break. <laughs> days. Living Good in the days. future, Ewan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to come back to just one point that you made earlier about... Um, boring bits of DNA. How do you know which bits are the boring bits? And actually we had a question come in that uh, touched on this too. Uh, someone has asked, um, is it possible that some of the boring bits are actually doing something that we just have no idea about? Ah, uh, yes. Well, I, I, this feels like my Moby Dick story, which is related to ENCODE. Um, because this question is a, is a harder question to answer than, than it looks. Uh, so, indeed, um, uh, we don't, you know, you can't be sure, you, can't, you know, maybe it is important. How do we know? How can one know? One thing we do know is there's a lot of the human genome that's made basically by genomic parasites. So bits of genome, 
that happily copy themselves across our own genome. We have a whole machinery to kind of dampen down this parasitic behavior. But in our genome, we're not so good at dampening them down over mammalian evolution. So about 50% has come about from different epochs of different genomic parasites that have kind of filled up our genome. Now, there are other genomes that have gone completely bonkers. They've completely just let, said, said to this, the, the kind of parasitic systems, okay, fine, you go replicate. So a lot of plant genomes are just, just stuffed full of this kind of parasitism everywhere. Um, there's some genomes which have crunched it down. They've got on top of these parasites and they've kind of lost them all. And that goes to the fugu, the pufferfish genome. Um, and the close relative was what Ug Rosecrelius analyzed to understand um, the, the, the human genome. So we sort of know that 50% of the genome comes from this origin, which is not, which, which is, seems to be quite parasitic. It is parasitic. It's in it for itself. But even then, the definition of interesting, not interesting, boring, not boring is quite tricky because they are, they're sort of exploited. Often when cancer happens, for example, these places run amok, they, weird things happen. Um, so it's very, very hard to know, actually. And that was, that was the focus of this uh, big project later on called ENCODE, uh, where we try to work out what the non-protein coding part of the human genome was doing. And it's still, it's still an open question. We know a lot more. <laughs> it's, it's definitely complicated, really, really complicated. Um, but there's still not a clean answer uh, to the question. So are there bits that you are certain are boring? No. No. But there are bits where we were pretty certain that, I mean, the most exciting thing this, this last year, so there's a couple of bits of our genome. Some, some organisms don't have this, but our genome has these big bits in the middle, which are sort of structurally used to pull apart the chromosomes and stuff like that. And, and they're, co they're completely different. They're, re they're repetitive in a completely different way called the centromeres. We also have these bits at the end called telomeres. We can understand those, those a little bit better. But centromeres are these big, they're three million letters long, they kind of repeat, and they seem to be only there as like a massive structural scaffold. Um, sometimes in one or two places, there's a little bit like an island of stuff in the middle of them. It's a bit curious, what is that doing? Um, but just in the last two years, um, new technologies have come along that allow you to through, read through them. So one of them is a Californian company called PacBio, um, but the other is a company that I you know, mentioned as kind of conflict of interest, <laughs> uh, often Nanopore. Um, uh, and both of these companies can, can read really, really long bits of DNA that we've never been able to do before. So it's quite exciting that we're going to see the whole thing end to end. And in some sense, because it's us, there is no boring bit of it. Yeah, um, there's no boring bit because it's it's you know the piece of information that starts every fertilized egg is is uh, are these polymers. So I think that brings me quite nicely onto the sort of current big questions that you are uh, trying to answer, and I guess your 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 hopes for the future about what we might discover. Yeah, so I, I do computers and I'm very, very lucky to work with, you know, 800 people, um, colleagues at uh, Amble EBI, and we do two different things. So one of them is we store information like the human genome for all of scientists, everyone to use. So we, we take it in from scientists around the world, we transform it into something that's more useful, and then we give it out. And we do this not just for humans, but mice and platypus and bread wheat and plankton and bacteria and every living thing is in scope uh, for this. Um, and we don't only do the genome, we do what the genome makes, which is RNA, and then what the RNAs make, which is proteins, and then how the proteins fold up and how the proteins form. It's like a whole, it's like if you were you know, it's even more complicated than different spectra to look at the night sky. There's just like many, many different ways of looking at biology. And, and the genome is just one of those ways to look at the information that's in biology. And so when scientists determine, a, for example, a protein structure, they deposit it either in Japan or the US or us, 
every night we swap notes, everybody swaps everything. And then every place gives out to everybody all of this information for free. Um, and that's quite a job. And that's, you know, my colleagues work tirelessly and it's great. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, I definitely get a kick out of feeling how much we're giving to the world uh, uh, for all of this. And then some of us also, or some of us also kind of try and make discoveries using computers in this. So this is where you're being a biologist, but you're not using a lab. You're not physically doing an experiment. You're, you're, you're using data to derive insights into biology and just understand life in a better way. Um, and uh, I still do that with my research group. Um, they are, they're, they're small, much smaller group of people perfectly formed um, uh, research group. Can you uh, tell them that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As the group. <laughs> As a group, you are perfectly formed. Um, uh, and, um, and it's amazing. I mean, I, I get it again, I just get an absolute kick. Uh, my student, Hannah, she just um, was, we were just looking at, you know, how does the back of the eye work, the right, right the back of the retina work. And we were looking at the human genetics of the eye. And I was like, Ooh, look at that. You know, did we expect that? Is that, is that interesting? You know, there's a little bit of that disease. I never knew that disease. Are we mm. sure? What's going on there? So I, I, I never gets tiring for me. Uh, I never get, uh, you know, I just get a kick out of it every time. I guess that's it. When you have something that is as intricate, as detailed as the data set that you are working with in many ways. I mean, there is, many many lifetimes of stuff to discover within it absolutely and you know life is really life is really complicated even simple life is really really complicated and you know because it's so every day we often don't some sometimes it feels like well well of course there's living things of course there are trees and little bugs and and humans and stuff like that but when you start getting into well how does it work you're like oh my god mm -hmm. this is amazing i mean how do we even get up in the morning i mean i mean it is just uh, how can we do this how do molecules encoded by a three billion letter thing organize themselves so that you can have a conversation like this it, it, <laughs> and create just amazing the technology to do so as well <laughs> take the technology to do yeah. so yeah exactly yeah, yeah it's true. just remarkable yeah it is it is yeah it's quite a bit mind-blowing um uh let's um let me go to some questions actually because we've had lots come in so um okay let's let's where should we start where should we start um okay how about, um, oh, this is a good one. This is one is from Eleanor uh, Clapp, and she says, how much discussion was there between the teams about whether parts of the human genome could be patented and how were these issues resolved? Yes, so- Should we, uh, should we say very quickly what the sort of commercial value um, yeah. would be of this? Well, Craig Venter, yeah, he, You've got, to, you've got to give him some respect, even if, you, even if you don't agree with what he did. And one of the things he did early on was he sequenced the interesting bits and he, he actually had a computer program write patterns. It was kind of, kind of genius. Um, <laughs> and so so all, the, all these patterns zipped in uh, on this. And then eventually the patent law, law system in America said, this is, this is, there's something a bit wrong here. This is not gonna work out very well. Um, but there was still a long period where people had patented just the existence of genes. And it did hold up research, still did have impacts quite long after, for example, the human genome. And that is one of the reasons why John Salston was so keen on two th that it was really going to be free and open. And also that free and open was free and open to companies as well. So the companies could build stuff on top of it. It's just that they couldn't, they couldn't have exclusive access to it like nobody can have exclusive access um but it was although patenting at that point had i think become it was still a bit of a contention but the major way that solera was going to monetize was licensing saying that you had to sign a contract say i would like to see this information 
and then you would promise promise not to do x y and z and the licensing terms if you're an academic were going to be basically that you were going to share it but if you were commercial the licensing terms would have a lot more kind of reach through um so that was that was his business plan um it was kind of in the dot-com boom era as well so there weren't mm. necessarily you know not all business plans survived that era um and eventually Solera, I mean, there were some really, really smart people in Solera, Gene Mars being one of them, but, but many, many others. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't in the long run a viable business. Um, so they did great science. Um, it, was a, it was one of those dot-com business moments. Yes, indeed. Best avoided one of those moments, if <laughs> yeah, you can. That's yeah. just advice for life. Um, <laughs> difficult to see them coming, though, unfortunately. Um, yeah. We have a, a question that's come in from uh, Charlie, who's a student at King's College London. Um, Charlie asks, for you, what is currently the most exciting thing using mass biodata, and what does it hold for the future of science? Ooh, that's so difficult. <laughs> well done, Charlie. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, to pick one thing, it's a bit like my daughter asking me, which is my favourite film? And I'm like, you know, that's not a well-formed question. <laughs> for me. Um, I tell you the different data sets which I'm really excited about. So one of them is we are tracking an insane number of wild humans. Wild meaning just humans, basically. And some of them live in the UK and some of them live in Denmark and some of them live in South Africa and some of them wherever. And it is really great. We, that's a lot of what my, my lab does is, is work on these, uh, on these data sets. The UK one is the UK Biobank. In fact, my parents are both our participants of the UK Biobank. <laughs> um, all of Denmark is rather remarkably like uh, you can get access to healthcare data as long as you, it's all anonymized and you follow all the rules and mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the other data sets which are really amazing, has really changed the, the biology, are these incredible imaging data sets. In particular, the, the, the smaller scales. And one of them is this, um, this kind of class of physics tricks called super resolution microscopy. This is where you image things below the wavelength of light. And you kind of have to it feels like you're cheating, but you're not cheating. There's, there's, a, way of, there's a way of doing that, which is not cheating. Um, and then this remarkable thing that you can just almost see atomic scale stuff, or you can see all the atomic scale stuff when it's average through these electron micro, uh, micro, microscopes. And that has just blossomed. It's just exploded. Um, and and it's, a, it's, it's remarkable what we can see. And so those data sets are really, really interesting uh, to get at. Yeah. I mean, I think that there is um, sort of an explosion in many ways of data right now. I, I, I agree with you about the, the biobank data, just um, the amount that you can potentially do with medical records when they're dealt with appropriately. Um, I like this question as well. This is an interesting one. Um, someone has asked, an anonymous attendee has asked, what is it about the parts, uh, presumably of the genome, that make them easy slash difficult to sequence? Yeah, uh, great question. Yeah. Why, aren't they all, why aren't they all equally as hard? Um, so the, the major reason why is because um, when, when two bits are very, very similar, we can't tell them apart. Well, it's harder and harder to tell them apart. And some bits of our genomes are very similar to other bits of our genomes. And um, because although you might think six billion letters is a lot of information, um, when you have a polymer that is going, is a choice of one in four, then you only actually need 15 letters or 16 letters in a row for it to be unique in that six billion. So that's kind of combinatorics of how many, how many letters do I need? And that's why Gene Myers originally said, wait a second, I don't need to know where bits of the genome are. The genome itself knows because of this combinatoric property. But that falls down when they're really, really similar. And they can be similar for different reasons. One of the reasons is this genome, these genome parasites. So these genome parasites repeat themselves. And so, so the recent ones are very similar. And then there's these big structural things like the centromere thing, which is an absolute nightmare. Um, and, and seemingly to make it work, you need big things and they have to be exactly the same. And so you have a whole, nearly exactly the same. You have a whole bunch of really big chunks which are just like complete 
almost block repeats of each other. And so those are the hard bits to sequence. I see. Well, you can't use the tricks. You can't use the tricks, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to go back, actually, to that question that we were talking about before in terms of the... Um, the healthcare data, because there was a question that came in quite early on, actually, which was, um, do you work with philosophers to address ethical questions around data? This is actually from uh, Anna from King's College London as well. And I guess when you're talking about medical data, when you're talking about DNA data, um, that is, uh, yeah, the ethical concerns of this yeah, is something. Yeah. Worth so, so we do, and it's great fun. It's great. It's, it's really interesting. And there's two different levels of this. So one of them is kind of philosophers and ethicists thinking about how to think about this data and everything, everything else. And then there's another thing, uh, actually just working with patients and citizens. And so the, you both are there. There's a kind of academic discipline of ethics mm. and how one thinks about data ethics. I actually think that there's a tendency to put the genome on a pedestal inappropriately. So we have lots of information which is personal to us, and, and my genome is only one of them. And actually, it's less important than my bank account number. So my bank account number and my visa card number and my mobile phone number are probably much more important personal pieces of information to me than my genome. Of course, I can't change my genome, but the, if, if you had my bank account number, you could, you could cause me a lot of harm in a way that is quite hard to do um, otherwise. So with healthcare data, I'm not a fan of putting the genome in a special box. It's not a, it's not a particularly special box. It has this unique property, which is if I know something about my, my genome, I know some things about my parents' mm. genomes and I know some things about my children's genomes. Um, but in general, we should consider the whole healthcare data about how one should think about healthcare data. And then that goes to this other side where it's really, really important that patients and citizens have systems that they can trust, they can put their trust into something. And then that trust is executed when we do this. And um, this is very culturally different. So in Denmark, that trust is kind of basically done by the Danish parliament and Danish law and stuff like that. In the UK, it's, for example, done by the NHS. People trust the NHS in a way that they, they don't trust many other things or they have less trust for other things um, and in America for example it's very often patient advocacy groups so groups that that group a group of patients together and then that group of patients sort of organize they become a charity that ends up being the place where which receives people's trust um, Japan does it differently um, uh, as well so um, it's quite interesting to explore this. Anna Middleton, who's a um, ethicist and social scientist, she's done some surveys around the world um, about these sorts of things that have been translated with lovely little cartoons. And there's a paper on this called Your DNA, Your Say uh, about this. So people study this and we work closely with it. And it's really important to realize that everything is done inside of a, an ethical, and legal framework, legal and ethical framework. Actually, the ethics are, for me, much, well, just as important as the legality side. Yeah, I mean, and me too. I think it's, um, yeah, it's incredibly important, that's, that side of things. I, I guess there's, there's a, another series of questions that are similar. Um, a few of them have come in that, that are asking a similar question. I guess there's an ethical thing around this too, which is when you're talking about sequencing the human genome, are we talking about one person's genome? Yeah, it's a very common question. So in practice, what happens is DNA is, it comes from an individual. And um, for the public project, about five individuals were the main people who, who donated. Um, there's probably another 25 more who donated little bits. When they donated, they, they went through an ethics process and they were anonymized. And the only thing we know about them is their sex and we can work that out, their, their genetic sex, of course, from, their, from the bits of genome that we can see um, and that they were healthy. Those, those are the only two things. Um, now, one of, the gene, one of those five genomes, in fact, the one that, that predominates the genome there's another thing that you can work out from people's genomes, and that is their, re the, their recent history in terms of going back uh, four or five, six generations. And so we can be pretty confident that one of these individuals was an African-American. 
because we know the DNA came from America. Um, and in fact, that genome flips from recent African ancestry to recent European ancestry to recent African ancestry to recent European ancestry. And so we, we know that that one of, the, one of the individuals that contributed to the reference genome is an African-American. It's very common in African-Americans to flip. Uh, they have uh, some recent European um, ancestry because of both nasty and, and perfectly normal um, uh, intermarriage and then on the nasty side, rape. Um, so uh, that's actually been really useful. It's been surprisingly useful um, that we've had ancestry flips um, in the reference human genome, and we've used it in a in a variety of places uh, for this. But I think it's also slightly it feels very right that um, that an individual with that complex history has uh, is is one of, is one of the main ways we represent ourselves. In terms of the interesting ways you've used it. Um... Isn't there still, right now, I was talking to the, uh, Adam Rutherford, who's my co-host on Radio 4, a very good friend of yours, Ewan. I was talking to him uh, earlier on today, and I tried, I couldn't quite remember this story, so I gave him a few of the words, and he told me that I had dreamt it. But I haven't dreamt it, have I? This, <laughs> this is something, that the, the very fact that they had ancestry that flipped between recent African descent and, and recent European descent was used, uh, well, you pick up the story. Sorry, yeah, so it was used um, when... <laughs> when the first Neanderthal genome was sequenced. So, so Neanderthals are upright bipedal hominids. They are, you know, they are uh, very, very close cousins with us and um, were considered a separate species and a brilliant, uh, lovely Swedish uh, scientist said, you know what, Let's see if we can sequence their DNA. They're, none of them are around, but we have these old bones. Now, there's a whole wonderful story. This is Svante Pabo and his colleagues, many colleagues around Svante. And, um, uh, uh, and he, over 10 years, worked out how to extract ancient DNA from um, human bones. You, you actually do all your techniques on cave bear bones. So you, you try it out on cave bears first, and then, then you only use the, the precious human bones right at the end where you know what you're doing. Um, and sequenced, amazingly, uh, Neanderthal genomes, uh, one, one Neanderthal bone in particular. Uh, and when that sequence was first being put together, um, there was a persistent slight bias towards European rather than African ancestry. And that was a real head bit, bit interesting. Now, one interpretation of that data was that uh, was very exciting, which was that Neanderthals and modern anatomical humans interbred. Presumably when modern anatomical humans left Africa and, and met Neanderthals. But there was a much more prosaic much more prosaic question, which was, was there some reason that either in the lab we had a piece of contamination or in the computer, were we biasing ourselves to certain types of matches and we were buying us ourselves to the European matches because at the time we thought the reference human genome was European ancestry. And so this ancestry flipping in the reference allowed us to, to eliminate that second option as a possibility. The first option was a European contamination was really complicated and they, they did a lot and lot of work on that. And then two years later, or a year later, they found this little tiny bone in, in a mountain in, um, in Russia, uh, close to- Human a bone? Uh, or... Well, ancient hmm. hominin bone. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, get, get it, get it, get it. <laughs> what is it? Uh, and it's very close to a village called Denisva. So it's called the Denisvan cave. And this bone was brilliant. So the previous Neanderthal bones, you would, you would have to sequence, you mainly sequence bacteria that had sat in the bone. So for every, only 2% of the DNA you got out was human and everything else was bacterial. This bone, 70% of the DNA was um, human, hominoid. So this was brilliant. 
And when they compared it to the genomes, it was clearly also an archaic human, hominid, a sister species to Neanderthal. And the groups that uh, it had clearly interbred with were in Papua New Guinea and Australian Aborigines. And it was such a strong signal that everybody sort of fell off their chair just like, <laughs> just like that. And secondly, there aren't that many Papua New Guineans in laboratories doing DNA sequencing compared with the number of Europeans. So at that point, we absolutely knew mm, not that hominid, hominid um, interbreeding, um, integration interbreeding happened. And it happened, it's happened at least twice, maybe three, four, five times. Um, there's a ghost species that we can see in the genomes of Neanderthals and Denisovans, uh, but we don't have a bone of. Um, so it's really, really fascinating. But so um, am I right in understanding then that uh, early humans bred with Neanderthals when they left Africa? So you see it in non-African DNA, but not in African DNA. Correct. Though it is made much more complicated by the fact that um, a lot of a group of people who left Africa then came back into Africa, both down the Nile and down East Africa as well, in particular down East Africa. So sorting out sorting out what's going on in so so humans we are we're an amazing species um we have exploded over the planet in such a small period of time it's ridiculous utterly ridiculous for a species um and we also keep on moving we seem to be like you know we just can't keep still and so every time you think you understand what's going on in a particular region. You look a little bit deeper and you're like, oh my God, those people didn't come from there. They must have come from somewhere else over there. And so uh, that keeps on going in and out of Africa in different directions and across Europe and all around the world. Uh, it is a complicated, we're a complicated species. Well, I'm very pleased I can go back to rather than tell him I didn't dream it. So that's, uh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's my um, uh, We have a nice question here. Um, says, greetings from Istanbul in Turkey. Um, what are your views on commercial DNA test companies like 23andMe gathering data and selling it, for example, to pharma companies? I guess this is sort of a step on from the um, medical data that we were talking about. Can DNA data ever truly be anonymized? Yeah, so this second question is, is um, depends on your definition of the word anonymized, uh, uh, which, is, which is the kind of lawyer's question answer to that. Um, but let me give you a different a, a story, a perspective on 23andMe, and that's a perspective that comes from a different invention, which was x-rays in the 19th century. So when Rotokin, Rotokin did had his x-ray, he saw his, um, his um, ring, he immediately said, this is going to be amazing, it's going to change the world. Um, but the first thing that was really done, commercial success of x-rays, was fairground portraiture. So this mm. was big in America. Uh, and you could go to a fairground and you could have your um, skeleton portraiture. So what happened was uh, an x-ray was taken of your body and then you would frame it and you would hang it on your dining room um, uh, wall and people would come in and say, oh, isn't that a skeleton? And you say, no, 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 that's not any skeleton. That's my skeleton. <laughs> So I've been, I've been 23 to me and I've realized that the motivation was, um, was, all, was very similar. You know, that's not any genome, that's mine. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of a way of showing off and uh, being, being technologically up there and, and everything else. And it's actually less useful than it looks because, for an individual because 23 and Me does it kind of on the cheap. Mm. If you have lots of people on the cheap, you can do something, but for any one individual, it ends up being a little bit tricky to work out anything profound uh, uh, about them. So I did not tick in 23andMe the please share my data with researchers, including pharma companies. Um, you know, they have a business model. They are very smart people there at 23andMe and they are pretty they're ethical. I'm sure they, I know, they hold up their, they don't um, disclose the information to other people, for example. But their business model does involve 
working out drugs from that data and, and selling it. So one has to go in with your eyes open. Hmm. So if you're happy to get your pair, fairground portraiture genome uh, and you swap it um, for the chance for this West Coast company to make a drug, that's your choice. I think that is, uh, that is an important point, actually. I think um, uh, there was one of, the, uh, one of the people who worked for them, I, th I think, was once um, at a conference and said that the kits that they sell are not the product. It's the DNA that they collect. That is the product. Um, and as you say, you are, in a sense, not just consenting for yourself, but potentially consenting for your children in some, some ways too, right? Yes, yeah. Um, uh, there's a question I think that ties into this quite neatly. Uh, this is by another anonymous uh, questioner, but it says, by analysing someone's genome, can one predict any genetic or hereditary diseases that they may suffer in future? Well, yes, and, and a number of places for a very small class of genes, uh, diseases and in a number of places around the world um, it's become routine to sequence the genome of people with suspected genetic diseases often in the first two years of life. Um, the UK is one place that does this, there are places, other places uh, do this very well, Australia uh, for example. The UK actually is a really good place that does this and um, you may say well if somebody's got a disease surely why, why, why do you need to sequence the genome but, but often doctors can be, clinicians can be confident that the, there's something wrong with the child, the child is not developing normally, or there's some defect. And then when you sequence the child's genome, and you often do it with, the, with both parents as well, you can say, right, now I know precisely what has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, in some very small cases, you can give a particular vitamin, you can give a particular drug, there's actually a, um, a deep stimulation for an epileptic uh, brain disorder that happens. So in a very small number of cases, that diagnosis really improves the life of the child. But nearly in all cases, what happens by making a really good diagnosis is you prepare the family better for what's going to happen next. And the family and the clinicians stop trying to work out what's going wrong with this child. And without a diagnosis, the child often has many, many more tests. Some of them are quite painful and invasive and difficult. So you really, really benefit the child. And then the final thing, and they showed this very nicely in Australia, is that most, many of the, the, the mistakes or the, the errors that we see actually happen in that generation. So they happen, they're not present in the parents, but they are present in the child. And, um, uh, when, in particular, when that happens, and you know that it's a de novo mutation, the clinicians can advise the parents differently about future children. And so they can say to the parents, well, if you did want to have another child, you probably would not have this same disease. Now, without a diagnosis, you can't be confident of that. So it, you can't tell everything. This is not all diseases. It's, it's a very small in some sense, subset of diseases, but it's it's two percent of live births. Hmm. It's it's quite um, you know there's a fair number of people every year that are born with these things. And that number is steadily going up, um, and it's an important part of of really good healthcare these days is doing this. Um, just on that point of um, sort of hereditary, uh, I guess, things being passed down from one generation to another. There's um, a, a question that picks up on that idea that asks, how do you think the instinct is passed from one generation to the next? Instinct? Mm. Well, Interpret that as you will, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, I don't know what, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the question means. Okay, so I would I guess, you know, you know how when you get like, I don't know, I mean, you're the biology man, so forgive me for all the things I'm saying. Yes, no, you know when you no. get like a creature who is born and is away from their parents and is capable of doing, I don't yeah. know, those kind of things. So yeah, it must be encoded in the genome. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? It's oh. absolutely remarkable. So, so in particular, um, I mean, there's, there's uh, you know, there are fish and, and there's definitely no parents hanging around. In fact, most organisms don't have this sort of teaching component from parent to, to, to child. It's only really not so many that do this. So all of that information must be somewhat encoded in the genome. Now, what there's a little bit of a, a thought here that the, it must be some sort of 
also emergent property of the genome probably interacting with the real world. So you d it's not the case that the genome knows, you know, just has a program that it runs through for all of these behaviors. Rather, it sets up a system where when that system interacts with the real world, consistently the following things happen. Um, and that's slightly different from, that's a different thing from the information being absolutely encoded um, in the genome. Now there's some structures and behaviors that we, we know are encoded in the genome in such a clear way, and we can change bits of the genome. So fruit fly courtship behavior, we can like switch things on and off, we can I make things that. happen in different times and places. Oh, it's, it's brilliant. It, it's a bit Frankenstein-y, but, but amazing what you can make a fruit fly do under your command <laughs> uh, uh, for these things. Um, uh, so so we, we, there's a bunch of innate behaviors which really are encoded, but there's a much bigger class of behaviors which, we, which one would describe as instinct, which is really that the genome encodes the structure which when interacting with the real world will achieve the sort of desired behavioral uh, responses over time. I think I've got time for just two last questions, two last quick questions. Um, one is from Alessandra McConville, uh, who asked, would there be an advantage to a new reference genome with modern techniques and a larger sample pool, um, as in multiple versions of each part of the genome from different people? Yes, this is a, this is a yes is the answer. <laughs> and the answer is, the, is a beast called the graph genome, where we don't, we don't have like one genome, we have like all the genomes like in an amazing graph. Now that has been the answer we have given for the last 15 years, which tells you mm. that it's harder than it looks to move people from this. In the meantime, what we do is we have a reference genome with extra little bits that might be important um, sort of placed on them in complicated ways. Now, thankfully humans, we are pretty, because we've exploded from this one place so quickly across Africa, as a species, we're, we're, we're pretty tight genetically. Um, chimpanzees, different chimpanzees across Africa have way more diversity than any two humans across the planet. So, um, and I, let's not even start on sea squirts and the dark fish and other things and, you know, <laughs> they really take it to a different level. So in terms of species, we're very, very tight genetically. And that means that most of the time, actually just picking any one of us is a reasonable thing. There are one or two parts of the genome where that's not the case, notably the major histopathology complex before somebody jumps on me. Um, uh, on the chat thing, no. Um, uh, so it's not true across the entire genome, but most of the genome, the single person, you know, pick any person um, uh, is fine. Um, okay, last question before I hand back over to Ken. Um, uh, how does Ewan think, this is from Paul, by the way, how does Ewan think teachers should advise young people with an interest in big data in the life sciences about university choices? Are they better heading down a science route for their first degree or following a coding slash computer science route? Yeah, uh, both work. Um, I was a science person who was a self-taught programmer. Um, I'm really glad programming is being taught in um, secondary school now. And so Python, a bit of Python, a bit of Unix, um, a bit of R will get you an incredibly long way uh, in this world. Um, but both routes are available. <laughs> um, and the most, you know, obviously the most important things are, um, one of them is just having a passion and really enjoying it. And then there's, you know, don't dodge the maths. It's not like you have to have really, really good maths, but you do have to have, you know, you need to be able to take logs and um, do probabilities. Those are probably the two <laughs> things that you've really got to get your head around. Uh, if you want to do this stuff. I mean, I think that's, um, that's my favourite thing you've said all night, you and don't dodge the math. Um, that's, uh, what a great point to end on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian. That was incredibly enjoyable. I thoroughly enjoyed that a lot. Um, Ken, back to you. That was very B BBC of me there, wasn't it? Ken, back to you. Yeah, back to you. <laughs>
It was. Um, oh, thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you, Ewan. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed that. And uh, I'd, I'd like to thank Hannah and Ewan for such a, an interesting discussion. Uh, I mean, it's given a really good picture of just how pervasive genomics has become. And I, I'm sure there'll be lots of attendees interested in finding out more. And following on from that last question, there's even some who might be thinking about studying maths, computing, um, and who might go on and be part of this field in the future. Um, as is always the case with these events, there were so many questions, more than we could get through in the time, um, but hopefully we managed to cover lots of the themes that were um, coming through on the, on the Q&A. Uh, if you'd like to be in the audience for the next event, then please remember this is the third of five in this series. The next is on the 29th of October. Uh, and then we'll be hearing from a panel of speakers uh, from the Wealth Genome Campus, all of whom were involved in the very beginning of the Human Genome Project that Ewan was discussing this evening. And uh, that event will be chaired by uh, Dr. Chris Gunter of the National Human Genome Research Institute in uh, the US, here in Washington. Uh, we are currently putting links in the chat um, with the website to our upcoming events uh, that we're hosting. Um, so you can sign up to those. We'll also put a link into the European Bioinformatics Institute website. Uh, the Connecting Science website, so you can find out more about the work that, um, that we do, and also to Hannah's website as well. Um, if you'd like to watch this talk again or share it with um, friends and family, then we'll be posting it uh, in a few days' time, so you can look out for that as well. Uh, final thing to say, uh, we will post a short survey. Please, if you can stay back just for a few minutes, we'd love to hear your feedback on tonight's event. It, it does help us um, improve these events in the future, and um, yeah, we would very much uh, read every single thing that you tell us. So that just leaves me to say thanks once again to Hannah and to Ewan uh, and for all of you for zooming in. Uh, stay safe, look after one another, and we'll see you again soon. Good night.